trying to get back to the basics of great products. Power comes from sharing information. I try to convince people to slow down. Free. Yeah. Open. This is the Soak Tyson Podcast. Hi, welcome to the Soaked by Slush podcast here with a new episode. My name is Isa Krautio and next to me is uh, Ona Porapudas. Hi, Ona. Hi. And for this uh, week's episode, we have a special guest. We have Edgar Vordal Axnes from Tibur. I, th- I see Hi. you nodding semi-approvingly of my pronunciation. What do you think? I think your Norwegian is very good. I'm I'm impressed. Thank you so much. I take that uh, take that uh, very warmly. Uh, welcome. Uh, would you like to give a short introduction of uh, who you are and and also why not why Tibur is? Yeah, exactly. So yeah, hi. My name is Edgar. I'm I'm the CEO and founder of, of Tibur. Um, having a background working with software. Um, well, uh, in in my whole career, um, I started my my founding founding years uh, during my years of study um when i did computer science and i think i've been i've been left with both both entrepreneurship and and uh, computer science um, all, all the time since then and um today we are 5 years down the history line of of uh, tibur uh, which started in 2016 we are now present in 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 five European countries, uh, we have a 200 employees. Uh, what we're working on is the um, is a is, a, is a very important area. It's about energy. We're trying to make energy smarter. That's the whole mission. Uh, it's to empower people to make smarter usage of of energy. So we we sell renewable energy to to households um, over our digital platform. Um, that's one of the cornerstones. Then the other one is to well. It's to make energy smarter, to make make your house spend energy at at times where it's wise and well as little as possible. So we are integrating a lot of technologies in order to to uh, fulfill that mission. So that's what we're working on currently. Nice. And what gave you the ignition to start working on Tiber? What was the kind of moment when, or was there a moment, or what gave you the incentive? to start well um i i work together with uh, daniel he's the co-founder of tibber and and we've been both he and me used to work with energy uh, energy companies across europe um we we deliver software to these energy companies across 11 different countries and over a period of time and and we figured out a couple of things that we really weren't able to puzzle together why was it like this so so one thing was that we saw that well in in the eyes of me as a consumer uh, i viewed energy and electricity as something super boring um super expensive and and very little innovation and and personally i found that very ironic since uh since uh, well a lot of the stuff that i'm using in my daily life which i find super modern you know streaming services, technology at home, and so on. All of this uses electricity. All of this is very digital and, and it uses electricity, but electricity as a product is very little digital in itself, or at least that's what we found at the point in time. And the other thing was looking at all of these energy companies out there, energy suppliers out there, um, we asked ourselves, who are the, going to be the Airbnb of, of energy, the Uber of energy? With, well, at, at least at that time, Uber was a little bit more popular than, than these days. And so on. So really to embed the, the digital customer experience and deliver to me as a customer more value, integrating stuff, you know. And so that was one aspect. And then the last one, we saw that there was this wave of consumer tech coming in with electric cars with um, solar panels for residential usage and um, and if you if you go to um shop electric shop nearby here and you want to pick up a panel heater um i think you need to be quite skilled if you do not pick up one coming with wi-fi included so 
what we saw that all appliances in your home gradually is now being controlled from your mobile telephone. And we saw this huge potential of connecting all of this to the total energy experience. And, and we couldn't really figure who of the existing players should be able to do that because they were like 100 year old companies and not innovating. The only thing they were innovating is how to run campaigns in order to fool me as a customer. So we couldn't really figure out how they were going to do tech innovation and product innovation, customer experience innovation in all of this. So when I and me and Daniel, uh, we were actually sitting at a restaurant in Helsinki, uh, we, we figured that, well, if we cannot figure out who is going to be this new player, why don't we do that ourselves? And that's what we did. That's amazing. Yeah, the you're right about the mental impressions immediately going to some something like, I guess, like no country for old men, Rockefeller type of old images and like very static, boring, no much, not much innovation ever since. And like, at least here in Finland, I'm sure it's similar in other places too. Like when you move, then people start calling you up with a contract. Uh, and, and that's basically the extent of it. And, and, and then you, uh, there's, I read a story about you starting to experiment on your home and kind of gaining insight on how this, uh, how, how energy as a sort of consumer product or service could be, uh, could be developed. Can you give some, can you, can you enlighten us a bit about your experiments and what you learned about how energy could be optimized? Yeah. So we, um, well, that was a, from a period of time where I, probably was uh, turning my whole family crazy because <laughs> I was doing all sorts of experiments in the home. But my conviction was that if if I can get some smart devices at home, I should be able to save energy. And I really wanted to test it out, uh, out myself. So the first thing I did was to try to figure out what in my home is spending energy and how can I make algorithms for, for actually calculating what, what consumes where. Um, and then during that period, I found out that 70% of my energy consumption went to heating. And I think that's a quite normal number uh, for most ho- households, at least in Nordic homes. Yeah. Um, it's a little bit different on, on the continent, but still it's, it's, a, it's a direction. And then I started investing uh, into all sorts of things, figuring out, uh, okay, let me make, I can I can switch to a heat pump, air to air heat pump in in one part of my home. I can switch to smart thermostats in other parts of my home, and then started to, to to actually program all of this to see what is the effect that I'm able to make. And during um, during a course of five months, I was able to uh, figure out what was the most effective ways, and I reduced my home's consumption from. Uh, 24,000 kilowatt hours, which is um, which is not an unnormal in in the market where 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 I live. Um, I reduced it from 24,000 to to 15,000 on a, on a yearly basis. Actually, Edgar, I can correct you there. It was even more impressive. It went down from 27,000. Actually, I remember. So it was even okay. more impressive than that. Yeah. <laughs> I love it that Isaac remembers it even better. You've been studying on this. You got to do your research, yeah. Yeah, and then and then then the job became into figuring out how can we really make this scale? How can we make all of this technology available to to normal people? Because that's that's normally the problem is that it's not necessarily the the lack of solutions; it's the lack of simple solutions that that I as a customer can um, yeah point and click, and that's what I do, and and then I leave the rest to technology and 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 so on. So so really to figure out how can we make all of this just seamlessly work in in a normal 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 day scenario. I wanted to continue on that what you said about kind of knowing what uses energy and how much and how to make it simpler for consumers. I don't know if you're familiar with Donella Meadows, a environmental scientist most known for her book uh, Limits to Growth, but she has written about leverage points to intervene in a system. So how to change a system? And one of the key ones is uh, structure of information, so access to information, for example. I was wondering, how important do you see for your customers, for any consumer, to know about their energy usage? um, And how important is that for kind of change of consumer behavior? 
I think it is critical. Uh, it's it's one of the, the few critical success factors in order to reduce consumption. Because if you, I, I don't think the problem is the lack of information, um, but it's uh, but the the amount of information that is available is is super well. It's huge, and it's a it's more about the question of how can we take all of that information and, and really find a way to communicate it to to everybody so that it's it gets something that you can act upon because i i think that throughout the whole my my life at least as an adult i i know that yeah i should consume less energy and heating consumes a lot of energy and blah 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 and i know all of these general principles but the point is to try to figure out a way to to make this actionable for you and not overwhelming, but in, a, in such a way that we can take you on board on a journey and, and then you get a couple of aha moments. And based on that, you can take a couple of actions. And that's the start of a journey. So instead of trying to explain everything at once to, to, to find the key things that can turn your home into a more sustainable home. And I, this is probably <clears throat> slightly different from from household to household or person to person how you perceive things but um there is one common denominator and, we, and that is to make it simple it is to make it so simple that you don't have to go to an electrician invest a lot of stuff in your home then you put a, a financial barrier for for most household also you shouldn't spend a lot of time on this so it should be really the effort that you need to invest personally should be very low and the result you get back it should be be great uh, way greater than 10 10x the the amount of time that's that's what you should perceive as the value and um, and when you get that right I, I believe then then we have done something that can well shift um, shift at least uh, some some hundreds of thousands of households into the right, the right direction it's an interesting perspective on that because uh, Tibber is, uh, I'm, I'm sure you, you would identify it on, to some extent as a purpose-driven uh, uh, company. Is I mean, you are running with a strong uh, uh, sort of intent to have an impact, I guess, on, on energy consumption and thereby uh, whatever other sustainability, sort of bigger picture uh, sort of uh, worldview you might have, or uh, I'm trying to not use the word agenda here. It sounds a little dirty, but you know what I mean. And, uh, and uh, uh, but, but so the insight here is, if I'm reading it correctly, is, is uh, to, to find the value proposition in, in, in practical, more simple things rather than trying to onboard a customer on some bigger, more overwhelming mission of like, okay, let's all together now, uh, get on this journey to sacrifice so we can, uh, like save on energy. It's, it's the value propositions have to be more concrete. And I, you also said simplistic. That's interesting. Yeah, I, I'm a huge believer in making things simple um, to make um, to make an experience feel very light. Um, I think there are there is a multitude of of, um, of ways to do stuff, and you can talk about the planet, you can talk about the the impact on the environment, and so on. All of these things are huge topics, and and you can feel very small as a person in in just having. <laughs> Uh, how should we solve all of this? So, so I think we started from from a different angle. That okay, we are aware of all of that, and that's that's why we're doing the stuff. But what we're really thrilled about is to make something that is supporting that huge thing with some smaller steps. And and what we are really thrilled about as founders of the company is to really to make great products to, to make great product experiences customer experiences so that you can feel that you um well when you have been onboarded to to tibber and downloaded the app and, and just filled in your information you should get a feeling that you've done something smart so you get some verifications around that after a few weeks you start we start popping up with a few different comparisons and then we also um, show you what um, what is the area in your home where you have the biggest potential to do something, but we only show you one thing. So I think um, in order to attack the bigger things, I think we need to think as product persons and, and to think 
about how a product is going to be used in in a massive scale. Definitely. Yeah. I think um, for customers, it's important to have the practical view. But as a company, you seem to have a big mission, uh, as as Isaac said, um, at least in your TechCrunch article, you said that your goal is to reduce the residential electricity consumption of the European households by 20%. That's a pretty tangible and uh, a big goal. How, what what do you think, how important is it for a company to have such a kind of clear and uh, grand mission? Uh, how much does it steer what you do and your decision making and your operations in general as a company? Oh, it's there's a lot of the actions that we do. Um, I would say that it's it's more of a direction than a goal. Um, because, uh, and, and it works in two different ways. In some extent, it limits us. In other ways, it really empowers us. So uh, in, in that mission about empowering people and, and the more concrete mission about reducing European residential energy consumption by 20%, we know that all the different initiatives we're doing should support that direction. It should lead us into that direction. Um, one example we did was that we, we're not defining ourselves as an energy company. We're defining ourselves that we're, we're a company driving exactly the mission that you, you said. And so instead of us, when we had launched the our app and, and analytics and everything around that, so instead of us having limited us into defining us ourselves as an energy company, we saw the we saw a huge need that in order for you to be empowered as a customer, you actually need some more more um, better insights of your home, and the better insights you can get through a real time energy meter. So we started investing into making our own. It's called Tibber Pulse. So it's a it's a hardware device that you it's a dongle that you plug into your meter. By that we're getting way better data. We can give you a lot of better insights. We can also control energy consumption at home and so on. If we were an energy company, we would never have invested in stuff like that. We would never have said that we should. That's what we should do. And but instead we are. We're driven by this mission. So we said, that, well, that's the absolutely logical thing to do. Let's start making our own hardware. Okay, we have never made hardware before. Okay, then we need to hire the best people we can get and start making that hardware. It's a, it's a nightmare of a logistical chain. And, um, but we just need to experience how, how it is. And then we made the first batch and we probably made with 300 different errors. Um, but now we are in the third year of being being also um, an hard hardware uh, consumer hardware maker, and and we are ex that's one of the areas we're expanding quite a lot because we see that technology needs to be a part of um, the solutions to to people. So instead of uh, that direction limiting us, it really empowered us, saying that okay, we actually need to do that. Nobody else has done that. We we just need to do that in order to fulfill our mission. Right, and that's is that kind of part of, of reinventing this new uh, type of energy company, uh, and and sort of uh, freeing yourself from the shackles of the legacy in that industry. Kind of uh, is it is it difficult to see these new avenues, or or, or I mean, I guess, I guess technology gives more opportunities than it limits. Yeah, and I also think that the term energy supplier will will hugely change. We have been right. challenging that thing from from day one in terms of becoming a digital one but now we're we're not just digital we're uh, we have a marketplace we're a hardware manufacturer we're doing balancing trading across europe in order to balance the whole grid and um and we have a couple of other things cooking uh, that can um, well that definitely does not fit into the classical uh, image of of uh, of being an energy supplier, so it, it's um, it's something completely else. So it's uh, um, so that's why I think it's way more important to to think about what is the direction where we're going and and does it fulfill a purpose? And uh, if it does, then we do it. 
instead of us trying to define ourselves in you know a square box and and that's it mm. i'm still interested because you you, uh, you have a very interesting perspective on on the sort of um uh value statement uh versus i guess sustainability or purpose driven agenda dichotomy and i i guess you don't even see it as a dichotomy or as a sort of a sort of binary that you have to choose from or compromise between uh how do you see that has it ever because at least it's it might not be true in that direction but sometimes you hear this meme said in the other way that like the reason why companies can't be sustainable is because they're too profit driven or because they're too sort of they're too sort of business plan driven and that can sometimes mud the purpose behind or muddy muddy the waters behind the sort of actual uh, purpose related to externalities or whatever do you see that this has ever been a challenge where you need to compromise between these two values or or has it has it so far been just uh, smooth sailing <laughs> well um it's never smooth sailing i guess but it's like, never smooth no. sailing so maybe maybe starting with an example we one of the facts we figured out before starting tipper mm -hmm. was that the whole energy industry across well the nordics europe the world is having one and one only profit model mm. business model so and and the way it goes is that uh, and this is valid for suppliers for grid companies for for traders for for the whole value chain of energy companies really and and how it works is that for each kilowatt hour they deliver to you they try to maximize the profit per kilowatt hour that's the game so they might try to sell it as as a low low thing but what they really try to do is to maximize the profit per kilowatt hour they deliver to you that's that's the business model right, right. The, more the more candy the more they, they sell, sell the more money they get kind of exactly yeah. so the more energy they sell to you yeah for their profit and the worse it is for your wallet the worse it is for the planet right. so it's really a business model that is um uh, well it's a dinosaur business model uh, in in all different aspects of it so when we started tiber we we said that let's never profit from the kilowatt hour we sell, never ever in our lives. That's the only area where we cannot profit. We can profit in many, many other different ways, but let's let's not do the same stuff that the whole industry has done for 100 years, because that gives us the wrong incentive. Mm. So we should have the same incentive as, as you, as a private person. And, and that happens to be the same incentive that our planet needs because we need to consume less and we need to consume it from from sources being more well being better for for the planet so so that lays a foundation where where to some extent it's it, there is no compromise on that one it's it's rooted in in the core of the company and so on but in the in the finer dimensions here there's a lot of different stuff that we need to evaluate the whole time but this one is so it's so simple a rule and what is interesting about it is that when starting a company you're doing a lot of stuff you're building an organization you're building products you're mar doing marketing and, and so on but the hardest thing for any company to do and change is to change their business model mm. and this is also one of the reasons why we chose this, this direction we, we chose a direction that nobody else had been doing earlier and we knew that they're going to have a hard time changing all of that as well in order to copy what we do. So as long as we go that direction, we say that we never profit from the kilowatt hour, then it means that we need to figure out other business models, other profit models, because obviously we need to make money in order to survive as a company and in order for investors to believe in us yeah. and in order for us to grow and so on and so forth. So that's what we did. Uh, and... and, um, and um, it's really um, it's really not easy to know what to do, but what we don't, but we, when but what we figured out was that when it's not easy to know what we want to do, then we should make it easy for us to know what we do not want to do. <laughs> and so it's um, to some extent it's both easy and hard in in that regard. We we know definitely we do have an 
ethical business profit uh, kind of guideline in terms of what we what we are not going to do, and then we also have a lot of freedom in order to shape our our um, yeah our business. So it sounds like you put a lot of effort in the beginning to kind of create a business model which has aligned incentives between um, investors, customers, planet, everything that the company does. Um, building on that, uh, what kind of benefits has that effort you put in the beginning had, for example, in recruiting or setting company culture or um, communications and so on? Like, what are the benefits you've seen compared to other companies that might not have the same kind of structure? Oh, I, it's a, it's a very, it's a crystal clear story to tell because it, it really it really maybe it's coming from us as um, this is not the first company we start we have made all the different errors earlier on in our career and and we were starting the company when we were in our mid 30s or something like that and because what we we were really conscious about yeah we know how to build products we know how to build teams we but what we what we know will have to work is is um is not is well we were maybe it's fair to say that we were on the hunt of virality i think that's what a lot of at least consumer businesses want to achieve is is virality in in terms of getting virality you need to have a you need to have a good platform in terms of scaling scaling with a story that is super clear and and uh, in on, in terms of onboarding you need to have the same story to investors, to the audience, and and to the consumers, and as well as to to the teammates you're trying to to get in the door. So, I think we spend a lot of time and uh, just getting that story so that it it really works across all of these different um, um, groups of, of very critical people around us. And the benefits around that later on has been, well, I. I, I think I would say that it has been very simple for us to raise money, and that has been easy because it has been super simple for us to tell a story, and that has been su- super simple for us because it has been we have been able to attract talent because of this very crystal clear mission, the very crystal clear no in terms of what we do not want to do, and uh, I think we've been able to get talent in the door that we well they basically said bye-bye to very, very nice compensation packages and, and jumped on a very risky startup in, instead of uh, pursuing a, a safer career bet. So uh, I think it's I think it's been vital in, in terms of how we have been able to move forward over, over these years. If I may follow up on something you said, um, you're a multiple time founder. It's not your fe- se- uh, first time founding a company. So you said you've already made a lot of the errors uh, that you've learned from. I've heard a lot of kind of people saying that being a founder is so hard in itself that they want to kind of start with the less, less of an impact driven company to learn the trade and then build an impact-driven company after after they made the mistakes and learned from them. Do you think that's, um, in your opinion, the right path to first learn the kind of trade and then go towards something you really believe in? Or should you start with the impact you want to make first and learn the trade while you do it? Is there any difference? I, I think you should start with what you find thrilling for yourself. I... Uh, I wouldn't have started Tibber if I didn't find it fun. If I didn't have anything personally that I, I am experiencing on a daily level that that um, uh, that I feel that this is well worth um, spending my spending my life on spending uh, sweating being being I'm I'm all you know starting a company you're almost harassing yourself every other second and it's a super painful process and in order to sustain through such a process uh you need to really try with it you need to be thrilled about what you do and i think that's a much bigger factor in terms of where you should start if you 
if you if you try to make a cookbook of how to be a founder, I think you're pretty lost. So I think you should. There is only one guideline: you should do what you're thrilled about. If it um, if it's um, if you're really thrilled about making an impact, well, don't start by making an accounting company or consultancy company first. And in order to learn the trade, rather get a good co-founder um, or a couple of other good people that can help you and uh, bringing on that experience. And then you do what you really care about. Well, that's at least my two cents. That sounds good. Good two cents. I'm uh, I'm still interested in because uh, you are in an industry with a lot of old players, as you've said, a lot of dinosaurs. Uh, what is that like? Because they're massive, a lot of them, and 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 it's a very sort of. Uh, uh, I mean, I, I, everyone gets energy to their house. It's basically everyone, and it's 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 everyone's used to it. Everyone's used to the old business model. I don't know what is it like uh, reinventing such a business, which is such a massive and strong legacy. Uh, there must be many aspects to it. Can, can you, yeah, what has it been like? Yeah, I'll, maybe one story here is um, what we really set out to do was was a very impossible thing. We we wanted to make a an, an, a product um, of you experiencing energy that makes you love the product. And that had never happened before. And the other thing we tried to achieve was that, well, I personally hate, as from being a consumer, I really, really hate salespeople, whether it's from the telephone or it's on the street or whatever. But I really hate those sales experiences because I know deep in my heart that I'm going to be fooled now because I know that that person there is going to get a one 100 euro bonus when he sells me something. And I know that that is not going to be the best deal I get. So I really hate those experiences. So what we what we also said that is that we will never ever hire any salespeople in the company, um, neither on the payroll nor through subsidiaries nor through partners. Never. So we we have no salespeople. And um, and when I, I I did say that aloud five years ago. And the whole industry was laughing at me. You cannot sell energy without having salespeople. That's the only thing you need. You have, need to have telemarketers. You need to have people running out there with getting bonuses for each and every contract they land with, with you. Our, our mindset was to build a great product and build a product that is so good that you tell your neighbor, your friend, your colleague about it. And today, we are growing with tens of thousands of customers each and every month with no salespeople. And obviously, I, I think this is a story that fits perfectly together with, with Gandhi's statement. Um, and I think Gandhi said, uh, said something like this. First, they ignore you. Then they laugh at you then they fight you and then you win and i think that's my experience with the existing industry is that in the start they were ignoring us they they and then they started laughing at us so yeah okay but you can't you guys can't do that um now they've been fighting us for a couple of years uh, and in our original market uh, being the norwegian market we now become the second biggest energy supplier and that's just after being in the market for three years and wow. that's that is a change that has been super fast in in this industry, and we are uh, well, we're uh, we're on the same track record in 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 the markets where we enter. So it's um, um yeah, I, I I think Gandhi said it the best way. That is a hats off move, I guess. No salespeople ever. That is a hats off. Very nice, uh, very <laughs> impressive. Yeah, <laughs> thanks. It is. Yeah. Do you have any questions? Any, uh, let me, I guess, uh, if you don't have any uh, other questions that we could, I mean, I'd love to hear what's next, what's, what's going on now. I mean, the trajectory seems m massive. Yeah, I think there are several things. We, we are, um, uh, we're five years down the line, as, as said, it still feels like we have just started. And for me, I think it's, uh, at least for me personally, it's, uh, it's an important field to have because then I know there is a motivation to do way more. And 
obviously we would like to, what we're working on is to is an expansion across Europe. Um, we're also looking into other geographies because we we see that there is the same need. We we see the same hints everywhere that that um, that this stuff uh, is both needed and it will fly. Um, but we also, my personal ambition is to disconnect my my own house from the the electric grid to to make my how, own house self sustained. Um, in order to get there, and in order to get there in a in a way that it's easy for people to to get there, that's quite a long journey. So that means that we need to develop a lot of technology, work with a lot of partners to figure out stuff that today seems quite impossible. So I'm, I'm pretty sure that we have a lot of challenges in front of us. That's really interesting. Uh, can you actually specify a little bit like, what is the benefit of having self-sustained energy uh, households? And is it energy efficient to have kind of households I don't know, create their own energy or what's the vision and what are the key bottlenecks to get there? Um, that depends. The last question there is highly depending uh, on on where you live in the world. Obviously, a huge challenge in, in the Nordic countries is, um, is heating during the winter. Um, so there's a lot of, lot of different things to attack there. Um, then you have the uh, well the, you definitely have solutions about how to produce your own energy you have solar uh, which is now getting uh, getting relatively affordable um but you do have a lot of challenges in storing energy um that's not on an affordable level today and and utilizing that in a in a way that makes sense so again this is more of a very concrete picture about a direction that that we are uh, very obsessed about and um i'm not entirely well i cannot say today that i'm 100 certain that it's possible that my home will will get there but i don't know that if we do not try we will never get there so i think we will continue hammering uh, and see how close we can get do you think you're gonna have to go through those gandhi steps again if you try to go completely <laughs> off the grid probably, <laughs> probably. yeah, probably. yeah. Right. Okay. But I respect the I respect the moxie. It's very nice. And also, it was a delight after, before when doing research for this episode. It was a delight to get to know Tibber. It sounds like a very, very, very uh, interesting uh, company. Definitely, I love the mission as well. Yeah. Uh, thank Fantastic. you, Edgar. Thank you for joining uh, us on the South by Slash podcast. Thanks. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Same. Thank you so much. And uh, remember to uh, subscribe, like, and comment, and we'll be back with the next episode shortly. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye.